I want to use some scripture this morning that is very familiar to you. From the Old Testament, the 18th chapter of 1 Kings. And, 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 and trying to be like a lot of other preachers and a lot of other churches, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little uh, text that will prick your interest, maybe. Uh, you know, I, I do watch and I listen to some of these guys, and they've always got all these fancy little uh, texts and everything, and, and I, I rarely ever have that. It's kind of like uh, when, I, when I was first went to California, I couldn't get over how many of the preachers out there were good singers. And man, they'd get up and sing before they preached, and they'd just have the whole congregation right in the palm of their hand by the time they got down to preaching. And I thought, man, I've really got a disadvantage here. I'm going to have to work against that. So I kind of developed my own thing. I said, now you guys take care of the singing. I'll take care of the preaching. And so that's kind of been my attitude is that you singers, you take care of the singing and I'll take care of the preaching. And the reason I say that, and they thought, well, he's a kind of a cocky preacher. Uh, but I have no doubt about the Lord. And, and I know the Lord will help me any time that, um, that, that, that I have the opportunity to preach his word. And, and he has proved that time and time again. And, and so uh, uh, because that's what he called me to do, he will help me to get the job done. I can't do it by myself, and I've always known that. But if I, if I have what is the title this morning, be Showtime. Now, in my earlier days... Uh, I, I, I did a little bit of acting and, uh, and, and participated in a number of productions. And no matter how well you do and how, regardless of how many times you had rehearsed and been through this thing, just before it was time to go on stage and they said it's showtime, there was always just a little bit of apprehension there as to how well it's going to go. Well, showtime in the word of the Lord this morning is a little different, but it's here. Elijah, the old prophet of the Lord, had been instructed by the Lord to go to the king Ahab and to say to him, it is not going to rain upon the earth until I give the word. And after that, Elijah had been to Ahab and had spoken those words Why the Lord took Elijah and he disappeared for three plus years insofar as Ahab was concerned. Couldn't find him. They, they searched throughout the kingdom. They had everyone else looking for Elijah and the Lord was taking care of him. And he had some people who were helping him uh, to see that he was provided for. And that's been my experience over the years that the Lord has always got some people to help out to see that his cause and his work goes on. We get the idea sometimes that we are the only one. We're the only one that's either standing true to the Lord or we're the only one that's going through the experiences that we're going through and no one else is. And far be that from the truth because most everything that we've ever experienced, someone else has already experienced it. But finally, uh, after a period of time, the Lord spoke unto Elijah and said, it's time for you to get up and to go to see Ahab. And as Elijah was making his journey back to the palace to see Ahab, he met a fellow by the name of Obadiah. And Obadiah now was a servant uh, of um, Ahab, and he had been sent out here specifically to try to find water and, and food for the herds of Ahab uh, during all this drought. And, and when Obadiah meets, Ahab, or meets uh, Elijah, yeah. Elijah says, You go and tell Ahab, Behold, Elijah cometh. And Obadiah says, You know what? Surely you must know that I am a God-fearing man, that, that, that I took 
at risk of my life during this drought period, and I, I fed and provided for many of the servants of the Lord. Secretly I did this because I fear the Lord and I love the Lord and I love his people. And, and if I go and tell Ahab, I have seen Elijah, he's going to kill me. Because he has taken a pledge or a decree has been made of everyone in the kingdom that none of us had seen or know where Elijah is. And if I go now and tell Ahab, behold, Elijah cometh, what's going to happen is the Lord will come along and take you away someplace that I don't know. And then Ahab is going to have me killed because he'll say, you've lied to me. Elijah said, you go and tell Ahab, behold, Elijah cometh. And so uh, Obadiah goes and he tells Ahab. Ahab then goes out to meet Elijah, and as he meets him, he says, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Are you the one that's causing all of this trouble? Now listen, let me tell you something. A lot of times you people like to blame the preacher. Sometimes it's not the preacher at all. Sometimes that's the Lord that's working in your heart. That's the Lord sometimes by His Holy Spirit that's speaking to you. It's not the preacher that can speak to your heart. I don't have that ability. I never have and I never will. But sometimes we get to thinking, well, that preacher's picking on me. He knows something about me that he shouldn't know. Now, I say that because I've been there a few times and I thought, you know, that old boy's up there and he knows exactly uh, the, who he's preaching to. He's preaching to me. I tell the story every once in a while that a number of years ago I came back uh, to a, an evangelistic conference being held in Kansas City. No one there accepting preachers. There must have been three or four hundred of them there. And this old boy gets up and he's preaching to us. He said, let me tell you something. He said, there are a lot of you men here who got this idea that you should be in the church in Big Bill. You're not a lot better preacher than where you're serving. And you don't understand why the Lord would have you in that little church that may be just struggling along. Boy, I think maybe he's talking right to me, Pam. And you've got this idea and people will help you and they'll promote it with you that you should be in a bigger church. And some of you have got your suitcase packed and you're just waiting for the call from Big Bill. And you know it's going to come. He said, let me tell you what you need to do. He said, you need to go home and unpack your suitcase. You go home and unpack your suitcase. And you say, Lord, thank you that you have allowed me to be where I am now. And when you get to the place to where you can do that, if the Lord needs you in Bigville... He'll give you the call. He'll pack your suitcase and you'll be able to go. And so, Bart, I've learned, you know, that I belong in the small church and Big Bill still not called me. And the Lord hasn't called me. But I'm thankful that I'm right where I'm at. I sometimes, I'm sure that you feel like I pick on you. And that sometimes I'm a little hard on you. And sometimes that maybe that I've singled you out. But I have never wasted a sermon on one individual. I can stand here and tell you that without any hesitancy whatsoever. I've never picked out a person and said, I'm going to preach that old boy with that old guy right over there. I'm going to preach to them this morning. Can't be done. Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And, and, and Elijah said, I have not troubled Israel. And thou in thy father's house in that you have forsaken the Lord. You're the one that has caused the problem. It's not me, Elijah said. And Elijah said, you know what? He said, it's, it's, it's showtime. It's time for these people to figure out who is the Lord. Now, they've gone away, from, Israel's gone away from the Lord. 
They've been following after all these gods that you've set up for them, Ahab. You've got 400 men that are doing that. You've got 450 more that are servants of Baal. You've got a total of 850 men here that you've been taking care of and providing for that are not serving the Lord. And I'm here at this point in time to say to the people, you're going to have to decide whether you're going to follow the Lord or whether you're going to follow Baal. Whether you're going to serve the Lord or whether you're going to follow Baal. Let me tell you something this morning. God has not changed in His Word. He still teaches. And, it, and I'm over in the Old Testament, so I need to get over to the New Testament for those of you who discredit the Old. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. You serve one or the other. You either serve the Lord or you serve the devil. Now that's just the two choices you got, people. Every day of our lives, that's what we've got to make the decision about. People say, oh, I don't want to hear that word decision. I don't care whether you want to hear the word decision or not. Every day of your life, you make decisions. And you decide every day whether you're going to serve the Lord or whether you're going to listen to the voice of the devil. Every one of you. Every single one of you here. Elijah said, you take those 850 men... And I will take the other side and we're going to decide whether you're going to serve the Lord or whether you're going to serve Balaam. He said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If God be God, serve Him. If Balaam, then serve Him. Sounds fair enough, doesn't it? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to prove which one is truly God. There are 850 of you. You take then a bullock and cut it in pieces and put it up on an altar here. When you finished with your show, now he doesn't say a show in here. You can't find that in there. You're not going to find show time in here. So if you're following along here, you, you, you can find where he's talking about the bullock and cutting it in pieces and putting it up on the, on, on the wood and place no fire under it. And then after you finish, then I will do the same thing and the God that answers my fire, he'll be the true God. Sometimes people need, they feel like anyway, that they've got to have some proof and they need to test the Lord and they need to say, Lord, give me a sign. Well, I just said, now this is what we're going to do. And the people said, that sounds good enough. They gathered all of the people together here. And, and, and so then Elijah said, okay, you guys, there's a lot of you. You go first. Now here's where the show starts. 850 of them, they get their sacrifice, they get their bullock, they cut it in pieces, they put their place down here, put the wood and put the, put the bullock on the top of the wood here, and the show begins. And they start calling upon Balaam. And they call on him, and old Elijah, he's sitting over here on the sideline. There's no fire. <laughs> He said, you know what, boys? You need to get a little louder. Maybe your God's asleep and he can't hear you and you need to wake him up. Now, I want to tell you all something right now and you just mark this down in your little day book. A loud preacher is no more effective than a soft voice preacher. I just happen to be a loud mouth preacher. But just depending on how loud I am is not how good it is. But somewhere along the line, a lot of our preachers got the idea that the louder they preached, the better it was. We get some of the craziest ideas you can imagine as preachers. Some of our preachers have got the idea if they don't cry, people don't think it's sincere. <coughs> or if they don't snot and slobber a lot, why, it's not sincere. Some have got the idea they got to do a striptease act when they get up. You know, we get started and it's too hot in here and we start taking our clothes off. And I always am intrigued by that. I wonder how far they're going to go. <laughs> Sometimes I want to say, the more you clap, the more they'll take off. <laughs> well, some of you won't know what that means, but some of you might. <clears throat> 
I'm only kidding. But, but folks, let me tell you something. Elijah sitting over here, what he says is truth. He says, you know what? You guys aren't getting loud enough. You need to wake him up. I tell the story. It's not a story. It's an experience. Jim Pulley, preacher friend of mine many years ago, he, got to, he was telling me one time, he said, you know, I've been pastoring this little church up over here in the uh, Cedar County. And he said, every Sunday night, he said, I go over there and preach there and I get them started and get to preaching. And he said, I look back and about three-fourths of them are sound asleep. <laughs> he said, one Sunday night I decided, you know what, I'm going to wake them up. He said, I was up there preaching away and I looked around and I saw half of them just about to sleep. He said, fire, fire, fire. He said, I want you to know they're jumping up out of the seats heading for the door. He said, hell's full of fire and people are sleeping. <laughs> I don't, only Jim Pulley could have come up with something like that, you know. The God that I serve neither sleeps nor slumbers. He's always on the job. But anyway, Elijah said, yeah, you guys, you need to get a little louder. And they got louder. They kept on pretty soon. He said, you know what? I don't believe you guys are sincere enough. I love when I hear people say, oh, you know, I don't really believe it matters. It matters what a person believes as long as they are sincere. Now, I want you to think about that a minute. If they're really sincere, you know it's got to be all right. That's baloney. They can be sincerely wrong. There'll be a lot of sincere people in hell. These, these old boys were sincere. You know why I believe that? You get in here reading, it says that they, they begin to cut themselves till the blood was flying. They're, they're, you know, they're bad. They, they somewhere along the line had remembered the Bible verse that said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And they weren't practicing this for their sins to be remitted, but they were wanting some fire to come down from out of heaven. And they were cutting themselves and the blood was coming out. That's not sincere. I don't know what it is. I've never yet preached to where I had the blood coming off of me. I've had a little sweat once in a while. Don't even have that very much anymore. We try to keep it comfortable for everyone. But in the old days, we didn't have air conditioning and padded pews and nice everything else. It was pretty tough going. Oh, Elijah's sitting over here and he's just watching them. He knows they're not going to get any answer. Not going to be any fire because they were using and serving the wrong one with the wrong means. The Bible says that it came to pass when the Midday was passed, and the prophets, now let me find my stop. And they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Yeah. Now they've had all day, and they put on a show. Let me tell you something. God is not looking to see how much of a show that any of us can make. What God is looking at is our hearts and what's in our hearts which should be manifested in our lives. You don't have to do anything for show. The best thing you can do is be who you are. God made you a unique individual. But when it came time... For the offering of the evening sacrifice. Now see, Elijah knew what the timing was here. He knew when it was time for the offering of the evening sacrifice. He said, okay, guys, you've had your turn. You've had your turn. You've had all this time. You've spent all this energy. You've done all this calling up on your gods, and you never got any fire. It didn't happen. How long halt you between two opinions was the question he had put to all these people who were here. If God be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. Well, Elijah said, now it's my turn. It's my turn. What did he do? The first thing he did was he repaired 
the broken down altar of the Lord. He had to go and to take and to rebuild what they had torn up. And he took and he placed the stones and he took a stone representing each of the tribes. He remembered the history and what it was that he was supposed to be doing and how he was supposed to be doing it. And then he took the bullock and he placed it upon the wood, placed the wood upon the stones and then the bullock upon the, on the wood. And then he said, you know what? I've got more confidence in my God than you guys had in yours. I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to take barrels of water and I want you to just pour it over and around the sacrifice. Pour it over. Barrels of water. I, you know, being the person I am, as I read this and as I've studied it from time to time, I still don't have the answer. Where did they get this water? They've been under droughts here. They've been people who are literally dying for lack of water. But they've got water here. I'm going to tell you something. Satan always has everything he needs to be able to get his job done. Now, don't you forget that. He's got everything at his disposal, and he doesn't hesitate to use it. Not for good, but for the wrong. Oh, Ahab had water stored here somewhere. Well, Elijah said, you bring and fill a trench here. Do it again. Do it again. And then finally, after that he had done that, the Bible says that Elijah then came time for the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. That's all he prayed. Loud praying isn't any more effective than silent praying is. We sometimes think that, oh, they didn't pray. Let me tell you something. If you only wait to hear somebody pray, you're in trouble. You better be praying a lot more than just what you say out loud. Oh, Elijah, though, he gets down here before all the congregation of Israel and he prays exactly 63 words. Now you can say, boy, that old boy is really smart. He knows a lot. No, I'm not. I took the time to count every word and wrote it down. The only mark in my Bible is right there beside that verse, 63. So if you were to pick it up, you wouldn't have a clue as to what that meant. But I told someone not long ago that, you know, you could, you could take my Bible. I think I said it here from the pulpit. You can take my Bible and claim it as yours if you want to because it doesn't even have a presentation page in it. And if it did, it wouldn't be filled out. I, and I've never marked in it other than right there. And there was a reason I wanted that 63 to be remindful to me. It's not how long we pray. Not how many words we say. It isn't for show, folks. It has to come sincere and be honest. And when you sit down and look and evaluate what oh, Elijah said here, it wasn't about him. He wanted God to demonstrate to these people that he was God. And y'all know the fire came down and consumed the burnt offering, consumed the wood, consumed the stones and the water. And the people said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Oh, they were convinced. I would have thought, you know, that and I've got to finish. I, I'm, I'm over. That, that this would have been a, a pinnacle in the life of Elijah to be able to see thousands and thousands of people here who recognize that God was truly God.
But it's just a few hours later that he's off out here after Jezebel has said, I'm after you hide, that he runs and he goes out here and he starts his pity trip. <laughs> He says, oh, Lord, I'm the only one that's left. <laughs> Let me tell you something. There was a show. The performance was fantastic. But it was in vain. The real show came when the old man of God humbly got down on his knees and talked to the Lord as though there was no one else there. And God answered. And that's what we need, is to be able to get down and talk to him so that we can get an answer. We don't need all of the show. We don't need all of the everything else that goes on. Now, I'm not, I'm, I, and please don't misunderstand me. There are some times when that I'm very emotional. There are some times, just as I said earlier, I am a loud preacher. I, I, I remember a few years ago, I, I, I'd think, as I'd start, I've got, to, I've got to tone it down. And I, I would. I'd get up and I'd, I'd get to where that I would just be standing here and I was just very, very calm about everything. But pretty soon there'd be something that would kind of hit me that would get me excited. And the first thing I know, I was louder than I ever was. So I thought, Lord, this is not working right. So I quit. Quit trying to do what I thought. And just listen to the Lord. So there are some times we need to be emotional. Sometimes we need to cry out to the Lord. But we need to cry out from the depths of our heart. Not just as how loud that we can hear. How long that it takes. It has to come from the heart. And when you do that, it won't make any difference. Whatever everyone else thinks about the show. What will count is what the results are.